Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce this afternoon Catherine Ingalls, who's part of the team here at EPCC, who's going to speak for a little bit about the HBC Europa 3 Research Visits Program and give a bit of information about what the program offers and how you can get involved. And then that's going to be followed by a short talk by one of the current HBC Europa 3 visitors, um, Livio Carenza, who is here from the University of Bari in Italy, is going to talk a little bit about the work he's done here um, on the Lattice Boltzmann methods for active fluids. I'm very pleased to hand over to Catherine, who will tell us all about what the HBC Europa 3 project is all about. HBC Europa 3 is a programme for collaborative research visits using high performance computing. As Claire said, I'm the HPC Europa 3 Transnational Access Coordinator here at EPCC. That basically means I organise the visits for people coming to EPCC and also to, um, I'm involved in the selection procedure for all visitors going to all centres. So I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of the programme before I pass over to Livio. So what I'm going to tell you about is what is HPC Europa 3? Uh, who can apply? Where can you visit? Why should you apply? How do you apply? And where can I find more information? So what is HBC Europa? HBC Europa 3 is the third HBC Europa programme, as you might guess. Um, and it's an EC funded programme which provides funding for short collaborative research visitor visits using high performance computing, or HPC as I'll be saying through the talk. So what do visitors get when they come for one of these visits? They get access to HPC systems, which includes some of the most powerful systems available in Europe at the moment. They get technical support and consultancy to help them make the best use of the HPC facilities that are provided. They get a, su a supportive collaborative environment working with a host researcher in their own field. So this is not necessarily within one of the HPC centres, but more normally with somebody in their own field, such as chemistry or physics or engineering, and they get travel and living expenses. The programme supports visits of, up to, of between 12, 2 and 13 weeks. Um, so typically an average visit would be about two months long. Duration of longer visits should be well justified because obviously when people apply, they might just think it's Oh well, I'll apply for 13 weeks, I'll apply for as long as I can. But actually, if you're applying for a longer visit, we would like to see why you want to come for that long visit. And we'd like to remind people, if they want to apply, that they can apply for more than one visit, so it can be a maximum total of 13 weeks. So in many ways, it's probably a better plan to come for a two-month two visit, perhaps, and then reapply for another visit later of another month. Um, the target for the programme, over four years and across the nine centres which offer the visitor programme is 1,220 visits and offering over 93 million core hours to our visitors. So it works out as about 75,000, I think, core hours per visitor on average, but obviously more is available to some visitors. Some visitors use fewer. That would be an average. So who can apply to HBC Europa? Basically anyone who's working on non-proprietary research which needs HPC. The reason we say non-proprietary research is that it is a condition of the European funding that the results can be published openly. So um, that's one of the criteria for applying. But otherwise, it's pretty much open to anyone. It's open to people at any level, from early postgraduates right up to full professors. And we do see a full range of these um, people applying for the programme. It's open to researchers in any discipline at all, as long as they can make use of HPC facilities. And this even includes social sciences. We have a, a small number of people that come from that background. So it's not just traditional um, disciplines such as physics and chemistry, which have long standing history of using HPC. It's open to academic researchers, but also to industrial and commercial researchers, though obviously fewer of them participate because of the non proprietary re research um, aspect. And it's open primarily to researchers currently based in the European Union and associated states. And there's a list on our webpage of all of those states. Um, 
anybody living in those those countries is currently automatically eligible to apply to the program there's also limited places available for researchers from other countries so it's not absolutely strictly related to um, restricted to those countries um, HPC experience is not necessarily a prerequisite because we can provide consultancy and support to visitors who come to um, to our centers there may also be courses available that you can attend. These are courses not provided specifically for HBC Europa visitors, but they are courses that we run as part of our normal um, the, what services we provide to, to users. And so visitors may be able to attend those if they coincide with them. If you want to find more out about the type of visitors that have come to EPCC, for example, in the program so far, which has been running just since 2017, there's a, a web link here. You'll be able to get these slides after the presentation. There's a web link there which tells you the names and home departments of all the visitors, their project titles, and the hosts that they have visited. So where can I visit if I'm an HPC Europa visitor? Where can I go? You can basically go to any research group in any of the nine participating countries. You'll see a map down at the bottom of this picture here. And uh, you probably can work out which countries they are. There's the UK and Ireland, Spain, Italy, Greece, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Finland. So you can visit any research group in any of those countries, as long as the research group is willing to have you, of course. Um, what you should do then is find a host researcher with matching interests in one of those nine countries. I should add that you're not allowed to apply to the country that you are currently working in. So for example, UK-based researchers cannot apply to a UK research group with this programme. It's a transnational access programme, so you have to go to another country. Um, there's a list of current hosts available on our web page. And new hosts can be added to this list at any time. This list is not an exhaustive list or a, a closed list. Anybody can be added at any time. These are just this is just a list of people who have previously been involved. The host researcher could be anywhere in the country. It doesn't have to be in the same country as the centre, which is the member of the HPC Europa Consortium. So this means that, for example, visitors coming to EPCC do not have to be in Edinburgh. They can be anywhere in the United Kingdom. We currently have visitors right now in Edinburgh, St Andrews, London and Reading. And I think we have nine visitors at present. So you can see that they're scattered about quite a bit. Visitors can also be hosted in an HPC centre if they're doing research into HPC itself, into tools or methods or whatever. But the more normal thing is for visitors to go to a more applied research department and still get the support from EPCC during their visit. So if you can't find, if you don't have anybody in mind who would be a, a host for your visit, and if you can't find anybody that looks like the right person on our list of current hosts, for example, we can help you to try and find someone. But obviously, you're the person who knows your research best. So you're the best place probably to try and find someone. But on the other hand, we have the experience, we have the contact, so we may be able to help you. So we usually recommend that people try to find a host first, but if they can't find someone, then they can get in touch and ask us if we know of anyone. It's important to point out as well that visitors use the facility at the HPC Centre in their host country. So if you apply to a research group in the UK, for example, you can't then go and use the facilities in Italy. If you're coming to the UK, you need to use the facilities in the UK. Or if you're going to Finland, you use the facilities in Finland. So there's, there's a connection there, that's how it works. Well, having just said that, I should point out that there's a, a British Isles region. We are slightly different. In the UK and Ireland, we've got a British Isles region. Um, and visitors to either the UK or Ireland can use either the systems in EPCC in Edinburgh or ICHEC in Ireland. Uh, but this is unusual in the HPC Europa programme. Otherwise, it would just be you use the facilities in the country that you're visiting. So why should I apply, you might ask? Well, there's many benefits to visiting HPC, uh, being an HPC Europa visitor. You can get better research results quicker by using HPC facilities. And this is obviously one of the most important draws of the programme. But you can also learn new skills, of course. These could be HPC skills and programming skills, or they could be research skills in your own field. 
You can extend your professional network and build opportunities for further ongoing collaborations after your visit. You might make new collaborative links and even future job prospects. Some other aspects that are less obvious, you get away from the usual commitments in your working life and you can focus entirely on your research, which is one of the things we find visitors really appreciate. And obviously, you also get to experience living and working in a different country, which is a valuable experience in itself. So a quick look at some project successes so far. Until mid-January 2019, we already had 25 publications resulting from visits that had started within the previous year, and we knew of more that were in preparation. So our visitors are, are doing good research and they're publishing their work, which is good. We've had some sex successful reapplications to the programme, sometimes from the same visitor, sometimes from others in their research group who apply to the same host group. And we know of other visitors that have come back to their host departments with alternative funding from other sources. So we're seeing clear, clear proof that there's ongoing collaboration after the visits are complete. We know about people who've secured jobs in their host department after their visit, or um, perhaps jo um, a job in another organisation, thanks to links that they've made during their visit. And there's other anecdotal benefits we've been told about, such as knowledge transfer between a visitor and PhD students from the same department in the office that he was sharing with them. Gather together some quotes from participants. Um, we've had very successful feedback so far in the visitor questionnaires and the host questionnaires and everybody has seemed to be satisfied even where there's been small problems people have been overall very satisfied with their visits which is very good to see so they've talked about valuable and enriching experiences and an excellent opportunity to gain access to HPC experts leading research centers and hardware resources which are not available elsewhere and my favorite one is one which says simply it has been the best professional and personal experience of my life our hosts have fed back very positively as well, uh, saying things like, it's an excellent way to have international collaborations with excellent scientists. So it's, it's good to see that it's not just the visitors who are benefiting from the programme, but also the hosts. And it's important to say that if you are a UK researcher, UK based researcher, you can also benefit from this programme as a host. You don't need to participate by taking by being a visitor you can find people that you would like to bring to your department to collaborate with you. So, how do I apply then? So you apply online at our webpage, www.hpceuropa.org. There are four closing dates per year, but you can apply at any time. The application form is always available. So you just apply whenever you're ready and then your application will be considered at the following selection meeting. You should aim to apply to a closing date that's between three and eight months before your intended short, uh, your intended start date. The reason for this is that you need about two months after the closing date for to hear the decision because the selection process takes a while. Then you need at least another month to organise your visit. But at the same time, you're asked to start your visit within six months of the acceptance letter. So there's a, a fairly tight um, sort of period during which you can come for your visit. So the closing date should be three to eight months before you intend to come. It is important to prepare your application well. The reviewers see very quickly which applications have been well thought out and which have just been thrown together in a hurry. So it's very worth your while preparing your application well. But the form can be completed in stages. You can save it as you go, so you don't have to sit down and do the whole thing at one, one, in one session, which is useful. We strongly, strongly recommend that you contact a host in advance and get their agreement. This massively increases your chances of having a successful application, partly because the host is more likely to give um, positive feedback if they know in advance about your application and um, they've agreed to already um, accept it. You might also get useful input from them. They might suggest things that you can change in your application that would make it stronger. Or even if they're not interested, they may be able to tell you of an alternative person who will be interested in hosting your visit. So it's really worth contacting the host in advance. 
And also, less importantly, but still an issue, we recommend that you check that suitable HPC resources are available at the centre that you will be um, getting your HPC resources from during your visit. Because, for example, sometimes people apply for um, access to a GPU machine and the, the centre that they've requested hasn't got a GPU machine. So it can be worth checking with the centre as well that the resources are available. Most importantly, we're here to help. You can contact staff at hpceuropa.org with any questions you have, and we'll be happy to help you out. But we do ask that you please read the guidelines and fact first. You would think this was a very obvious thing, but we know from experience that people don't read them. So please help us out a little bit by lightening our workload by reading the guidelines that we've provided for you before starting to fill in the form or before asking us any questions. So where to find more information? If you're looking for from the project, we'd suggest that you look at the web page first of all. And if you want to find out information about the individual centres that are involved in the programme, there's uh, you'll find that at the, the link Transnational Access on the web page. It has a list of the nine centres and you can find out more about the facilities that are available at each one and any particular um, disciplines that are strongly associated with them, for example. And also, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll find lots of details about visitors that are, we always update when visitors are arriving and you'll find out all the news from the programme. If you want to find out more information from the visitors themselves, you can look at the visitor project abstracts on the web page, which is something that visitors are required to do at the end of their visit, which then gets passed on to the European Commission. This is just a very short summary of the work they have done, but it will give you a good view of the overall breadth of subjects that are covered by HBC Europa. The first project directory is also available online. This is a slightly longer report from each visitor, which is more like a mini paper of a page, sometimes telling you, telling you the background of the, the project and what happened and all the results. And we also have blog articles from some of our visitors, which you can look at, and that's a more informal way to find out about their visit. And it will tell you more than just about the science sometimes. It will tell you what else they liked about their, their time in the foreign country that they were in. There's a previous Archer, Archer webinar as well, which is archived, which you can go back and view as well. That looks in more detail at the application form in particular and would give you an idea of what you need to fill in on the form and why we ask it. OK, so that's my side of things. Any questions for me? Can I go to Switzerland? Um, you can't go to Switzerland. Swiss people can come here. So the countries are Sweden, Finland, UK, Ireland, Spain, Italy, Greece, Greece and Germany, Netherlands. Netherlands. Yeah. So you will see on the HPC Europa pro, uh, website that we have a partner in France. And this causes some confusion because people think they can apply to centres, to research groups in France. But unfortunately, the French partners did not want to be involved in the visitor programme this time. So while they're involved in some peripheral activities in the programme, they're not involved in the research visits. So it's not possible to go to France for an HBC Europa visit this time round either. Um, it was in the past, but not anymore, unfortunately. Anything else? I can pass to you, Livio, then. I'm Livio Carenza, a PhD student at the University of Bari. Uh, and today I will, and actually at the moment, a visitor uh, in Edinburgh uh, in the HPC Europa project. Uh, and today I will present my work on active matter. Um, OK, first of all, what is active matter? Uh, imagine that active constituents such as fish in a school self arranged in organ patterns. Such systems have been known with the term active matter, and they can be considered generally as a particular kind of condensed matter, soft matter. Uh, what is particular about active matter is that active uh, energy injection occurs at small length scales, I mean, at the level of individual uh, constituents. Uh, so, uh, the point is that injection of energy that usually in physical system happens on very large length scales. Inactive matter usually happens at the length scales of individual constituents. So, these kind of systems are inherently evolved 
uh, inherently out of equilibrium, far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And actually, their origin can be both biological or artificial. And actually, uh, also land scales may vary a lot. For example, from hundreds of meters uh, in uh, skulls of fish or flock of birds uh, to centimeters as um, for insect swarmings um, or uh, even to microscopical systems uh, that are actually characterized by much smaller land scales. Uh, for example, here in this picture, you're seeing a suspension of microalgae. Uh, and even bacteria can be uh, looked as active systems or cells in a um, tissue, a, an animal tissue, for example. So actually, for example, a, a cancer cells can be looked as active matter. So uh, the aim, as we will see, the aim of active matter is actually uh, may have some uh, medical application. So first of all, the point is that we need to understand what is active matter, how to model it, and how to solve the equation that can model active matter. So, first of all, active constituents interact with each other, leading to interesting and unexpected properties. And in this presentation, we will con uh, I, I will basically speak uh, only about wet system. Uh, in, in active wet system, actually, constituent exchange momentum among themselves and with the surrounding environment. Think about some bacteria that are actually swimming in a fluid. They are uh, transferring some, some energy to the surrounding fluid. So the, the energy can be uh, a kinetic energy of the, these animals that are swimming, or at the same time, it can be a kinetic energy of the fluid. So what is uh, interesting is that there are a lot, a, a huge amount of mm, surprising behaviors ranging from spontaneous flow that is actually, uh, basically, you have this energy that, uh, that is due to the consumption of internal chemical energy, and this can be used uh, inside this active system to sustain self-sustain flows in, 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 in the fluid environment. This uh, has been shown to lead to some superfluid and negative viscosity behavior that are uh, quite a fascinating matter in, uh, in the actual research, or even to active turbulence. So that is, active flows have been found to the vertical structures that are resembling those typical of hydrodynamic uh, Kolmogorov of turbulence, uh, that is basically the one that you have uh, in the smoke of a cigarette. You know that those vertical patterns are can they are an example of uh, classic turbulence. But they actually have been found in bacterial suspension. It is quite, this was quite surprising. So why active matter? First. You can use, you can think to use active matter to design new smart materials that are capable to change their physical properties uh, as the environment uh, properties change. And this can be exploited even in medical applications such as drug delivery. But, and from a physical point of view, this is a testing ground for theoretical topics regarding non equilibrium system. So, this is a in summary of the presentation, actually, I, I, I will present only the first two points and the last point. So we will go through the dynamical model of, for active matter and some numeric and computational methods that are usually used to deal with the uh, active matter equations. And then I will produce some results on active cholesterol droplets that is actually a um, topic that I deal with in, in my visit in Edinburgh. So. Many theories have been developed so far to describe active matter ranging from age-based models to continuum coarse-grain theories. So imagine that you have a swimmer and denote uh, the direction uh, of the axis of, this, of symmetry of the swimmer with a um, versor nu. OK, now uh, you may like to describe how uh, this object, this swimmer, this animal is moving inside the fluid. So you can think that the direction of swimming is actually the one of the axis of symmetry. Uh, so you can, have, uh, it is reason reasonable to assume that the swimming speed of such active constituents may be proportional to a certain active force 
the, the swimmer itself is applying on the surrounding fluid. And then you may think to uh, include in, into your description uh, the effect of, uh, of the environment through uh, um, some Gaussian noise, uh, both in the velocity evolution equation or uh, in the orientation of the swimmer. So, and you can even model uh, the presence of many stars by adding a, a self-interaction terms about uh, among different different swimmers. So, the problem of this kind of models that uh, are actually quite successful to catch some properties of active matter is that active Brownian models, uh, as the one that are uh, in the previous slide, so, uh, are. are unfortunately suffers of some issues su uh, such as a limited of no number of constituents can be considered and environment only appears as a background noise. So particle-based theories cannot be used to model active fluids where the density of active constituents can be very high and the hydrodynamic feedback due to the gauge between the swimmers and the flow is fundamental to catch the essential features of active fluids, which is the solution. You can think to have a coarse grain description of your system. So you can use a polarization field to catch, which is the average orientation of the swimmer in a in a certain in a certain region of the space, and and even perform the same kind of operation to describe the concentration of active constituents. So you usually uh, deal with a with the evolution of a concentration field, the scalar concentration field, and the polarization field is actually describing the average orientation of the swimmer inside a certain region of the fluid. Um, and for the moment, this uh, actually, uh, even if uh, mm, the directional order is not preserved, you can have uh, a nematic order that is, uh, you may lose the head symmetry, I mean, and you may have some head tail symmetry, and in that case, the system is not anymore polar, but in, in this case, it's uh, considered as an emmatic system and must be described with a um, tensor order parameter that is a, um, commonly known as a uh, nematic tensor that is uh, invariant under head tail tree operations. So, the, the the, um, we need evolution equation for the two order parameters that are the concentration field and, and the polarization field. You can use, if you, you assume that these animals, these bacteria are not dying or reproducing uh, during the observation the, of, of the phenomena that you want to describe, you can use a conserved equation, you have conserved concentration field and let it evolve with an advection equation and you can use a adaptive Erickson Leslie equation for the treatment of a vector field that actually allows you to uh, describe the evolution of the direction of swimming of uh, of the bacteria. And then you also need a, an equation for describing the evolution of a uh, of the velocity of the fluid, the underlying fluid. And this can be done with an incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. This equation must include some active effect, uh, otherwise you would deal with a, with a classical uh, evolution for, for, for a um, liquid crystal gel. And to include this active stress, you can look at each swimmer as a um, pusher rod that is acting uh, on the surrounding fluid and the surrounding environment with a force dipole. If you perform a coarse grain operation over the over a, 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 a sufficiently big amount of swimmers, you end with a stress tensor, an, an active stress tensor that is depe uh, dependent on the, mm, the direction of swimming as expected, actually. And these effects can be controlled by a, an activity parameter that uh, I, I, I um, uh, actually zeta with this, with this zeta active parameter, yeah. 
the equation for active fluids are actually very very uh, expensive for for a uh, from a computational point of view you have three different equations one of them is a vector two of them are vector uh, equations so it means a lot of field to evolve and this is why mm, lattice boltzmann method has been widely used in the analysis of active uh, of active fluids uh, Lattice Boltzmann methods are a class of computational methods based on a dis discretized version of the Boltzmann equation where both physical and velocity spaced are discretized. So fluid particles can only move in definite direction in space and mm, you have a distribution function defined on the di discrete lattice on grid points and along lattice velocities. Uh, so, assuming the system close to equilibrium, the collision operator can be expanded in terms of an equilibrium set of distribution function, and this allows you to reduce incredibly the amount of computational power uh, needed to integrate uh, hydrodynamic equation with respect to um, more common methods like finite difference uh, methods or pseudo-spectral methods. So, uh, actually, Another feature of lattice Boltzmann method is that they can be easily parallelized um, because of two reasons. First of all, um, lattice Boltzmann method, yes, is fast, but is uh, actually is um, in, deserves a lot, a lot of memory resources, and you still have to deal with long processing times. So. Uh, in order to reduce the amount of uh, time needed to integrate uh, active matter equation, you can think to divide uh, the computational domain in uh, uh, subgrid, in subdomains. And uh, you may use some um, tools like MPI to parallelize uh, your code. So this means that um, actually uh, each processor uh, is able to communicate uh, I I with each other inside the, a, a unique uh, um, program, and so it's like you have a lot of workers that they uh, uh, they are uh, working on the same project, sharing uh, the data with a protocol that is uh, actually uh, controlled by the the, uh, the message passing interface that you are implementing. This the the main problem uh, when dealing with integration of uh, differential equation is that when you get to the end with the when you get to the size of your uh, your computational size you may like to perform a, a derivative for example but the data that you need are uh, share uh, they are not shared with the with the other processor so you need uh, you, you need a protocol to communicate with with the uh, with processors inside a unique execution of the program. And here you see a graph showing uh, a strong scaling test. So on the x-axis, you see the number of processors that has been used to integrate the dynamical equation. And on the y-axis, you see the speed up uh, corresponding to the I mean, uh, normalize with respect of uh, with respect to the amount of time that you need to operate the same uh, operation, the same evolution with just one processor. You see that uh, with the black line, you see uh, the e ideal scaling, and you see that using Archer or uh, Marconi, that are two infrastructure. Actually, Archer is the infrastructure that I've been using here in Edinburgh. You see that the scaling is pretty good actually all very very close to the ideal one and uh, this actually um to have a, an idea uh, you can get results in one day uh if you're using 256 processor you can get results that otherwise using just one processor you would get in almost one year <laughs> that is a something very good actually <laughs> for your research um so uh, I think that I'm running out of time, so I will skip 
the part about spontaneous flow, and I will directly go on the part uh, on active droplets. Uh, this is uh, my research group. I've been working here in uh, uh, Edinburgh with Professor Davide Marenduzzo, and actually Giuseppe Gonnella is my tutor in Bari, and while well, Giuseppe Negro is a um, a, a colleague of mine that is actually here in Edinburgh as well for the same project. Uh, we have been working together on the analysis of active droplets. The point is, what happens if activity is confined? Recent experience, uh, experiments managed to confine active behavior in shells of liquid crystals, and they have shown that shells rotate under the effect of activity injection, active injection. So the point is that uh, actually in, in this moment uh, we are looking for some droplet propulsion uh, that is uh, that may be exploited in application aimed at drug delivery. So the point is that to simulate such system, a three-dimensional approach is compulsory, and for the same reason you need an HPC approach, so a high-performance computing approach. So. In this slide, you see uh, what uh, we simulated in an active pneumatic droplet. This droplet, you see in the, the top left panel of uh, the figure on the right, you see that this droplet is actually uh, characterized by the deformation pattern of the, the pneumatic field and characterized by two bojums. You can see them from the top view in the middle left panel of the figure. They are characterized by the vortex. This vortex in the pneumatic pattern also generates a flow that is actually uh, that is forcing the droplet to rotate. And this is generating a velocity field, not trivial velocity field, uh, in, in, in the planar configuration, as you maybe uh, you see better in a in this video showing the evolution, the dynamics of this droplet. And so this is actually, the, this was the first step of our research here in Edinburgh that was trying to replicate experimental results. And actually we managed since this droplet, this pneumatic droplet is rotating and generating a not trivial velocity field. Uh, but the point is that, uh, we were looking we were looking for some other property actually we want this droplet not only to rotate but to move uh if the point is that maybe the pneumatic system not the best one uh to to get a propulsion this is why uh this is why uh um, we, we try to simulate active chira uh, droplets. First of all, chirality is ubiquitous in biological matter. Think about DNA. DNA is characterized by an helix, and even actomyosin um, systems and fibers, the one that actually uh, allows for the movement uh, of muscle, contraction of muscles in, in animals, they are chiral system. Microtubules that are some... Um, structure that are implemented for the, the in cell motility and division uh, are chiral as well. And chirality is at the base of life and is exploited in cell motility, uh, for example, in motor proteins or um, flagella of bacteria, as you can see in the, in the, in the picture on uh, the, usually bacteria are equipped with a um, with flagella, these flagella are uh, uh, they form an helix, so they are these are chiral systems. The, if this helix rotate, the bacteria is propelled in the direction of its axis of symmetry. So we try to make this droplet, the droplet of the previous slides, chiral. And what we found was that uh, the defect configuration changed according to the um, chirality of the, um, of, of the liquid crystal. And we managed actually to get a different dynamics. You see the droplet still rotates, still rotates, but at the same time, the movement uh, of this fun-like movement is leading to cell propulsion as, here, as you see in the movie. So, this may be a road, a path to be followed 
uh, follow uh, in order to obtain, uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, in order to obtain uh, cell motility. Actually, I think that I took more than the time that uh, and I, I will close my presentation here and I, I would be glad to answer any question. Uh, yes, Michael, the point, the point is that in, uh, uh, it's, it's not yet clear. Uh, in works of Michael Cates and Julia Yeomans, uh, this was, um, they already realized that uh, active system may undergo uh, a negative viscosity state, but at first they, mm, uh, it, it actually, uh, they were looking at this phenomena as uh, unstable. At the moment, some experiments are showing that uh, this mode is actually possible in active matter and even some numerical experiments are uh, confirming uh, this point so um, there is no uh, completure about negative viscosity uh, but um, so y yes can be seen as a type of instability if you look at this as a, from from the point uh, from um, the point of view of uh, spontaneous flow. So yes, spontaneous flow are generating a flow that is actually, uh, that is generating a negative viscosity state. The, um, localized and short-lived in, so the question is, so these instabilities are localized and short-lived in simulations? Uh, it depends, again. It depends on the uh, geometry of the system. So it depends on boundary conditions and even on the intensity of the act active forcing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? OK. I don't think there's any more questions. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you do have any questions, you can contact me or Olivio. Um, most of you know how to contact me anyway, but you can find me on the EPCC webpage. And if you want to get in touch with Livio, just contact me and I can put you in yeah, touch. Yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Livio.